It's nice to meet all of you today. Today is the second day of the redemptive history. Let us all start with a prayer. Father God, you who are abundant in glory and blessings, we lift up to you all honor and thanksgiving. You have loved us so. And you have shown us your redemptive history. I pray that we may always be strengthened by your love and your grace. And we sincerely thank you. And we thank you for allowing us to hold this Redemptive History Seminar. And Father, we sincerely thank you for allowing us to yearn after your word as we understand and learn of your word. I pray that we may become a a new creation that is able to enter into the new Jerusalem. Father God, I pray that your Holy Spirit may be with us, that you may open up all of our minds and grant us the wisdom and fill us so that this may be a time of joy and happiness. Father God, I pray that you may be with all of the pastors that is preaching today and may you strengthen them May you be with all of our saints who are home. May you bless them with the hope of eternal life. Father God, we thank you for all of these things. And in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Today is the second day of the Redemptive History Seminar. And today, I am uh, going to be the third speaker, and I would like to give you a message entitled, The Number of Generations Omitted. So today's scripture reading is Matthew chapter 1, 3, and 4. Judah was the father of Perez and Zerah by Tamar. Perez was the father of Hezron, and Hezron was the father of Ram. Ram was the father of Amidatab, Amidatab the father of Nashon, and the Nashon the father of Solomon. This is the word of God. Amen. <laughs> 
before we start, uh, we're probably going to be writing a lot in Korean. I'm going to be speaking in English, uh, but I will be writing a lot in Korean, so please follow along carefully. First, let us look at the first period of Jesus' genealogy in Matthew chapter 1. We can see there's a total of 14 different generations and names. The first person is Abraham, who was born in 2166 B.C. And then we see Isaac, Jacob, Judah, Perez, Hezron, Ram, Aminadab, Nashon, Solomon, Boaz, Obed, Jesse, and King David. And we can see in 1003 B.C. Uh, where King David uh, turns from just the king of Hebron to the king of Israel. Yesterday, we studied that there's a unique period of time or unique characteristic about this period. Between Ram and Aminadab, there is an omission. And between Salmon and Boaz, there is also another omission. So if we look at this a little bit more into detail, from Abraham to King David, there is a total of how many years? 1,163 years, and there are uh, omissions. First, it is the omission between Ram and Amidadab, which is the uh, period of Egyptian slavery. And then the second period is the period of the judges between Salmon and Boaz. So there are two omissions, and I would like to study this first period of the Egyptian slavery. If there's one thing that we must concentrate on, is the 1,163 years. This is the longest period between the first, second, and third period. 1,163 years... If we were to divide it by 30 years, which is approximately one generation, we can see uh, that there's approximately 30 generations. But only 14 generations are recorded, which means that there is a pretty big difference. Today, you and I will study uh, the omissions of the Egyptian slavery and share the grace of God. So what does it mean to be omitted from the genealogy in the Bible? When you look at Matthew chapter 1 verse 1, the record of the genealogy of Jesus and the Messiah and the son of David and the son of Abraham. Now, in Korean, it says uh, Jesus Christ, the world. But uh, in Greek, it is ge in Hebrew, it's Genesos, it's Biblius Genesos, which can also be, which is also in Greek, Sefer Toledoth. It means birth, and Genesos also means beginning, or the origin. Toledoth also means uh, generations. And this word Biblos and Sefer refer to a book. When we look at these two meanings together, it means a genealogical book.
If we were to look at Genesis and Toledoth a little bit more deeply, we can see that Toledoth Now, there is the main character, the, the start of the genealogy. And through the lineage of this main character, God will enact his redemptive administration. And that's what a, that's what a Toledoth is. So, a genealogy that it selectively uh, includes these accounts of these people. It has separated these people, and that is why there are omissions in the genealogy. So there are omitted generations in the genealogy, and these omitted ge uh, generations only record the most important and essential figures in the history of redemption. Therefore, you and I in order for us to be recorded in the book of genealogy, we must become the figures and characters that are essential in the history of redemption. So we just called it the book of genealogy. When you look at the meaning a little bit deeper, the book has a beginning and an end. And we called it the genealogical book of Jesus Christ. Therefore, even in the book of genealogy, there is a beginning and end. So, what is it a beginning and end of? It is the beginning and end of the redemptive history. And when you write a book, the book holds the ideas and thoughts of the author. Who wrote, who authored the history of redemption? It is the Alpha and Omega, the Almighty God. The Almighty God recorded his thoughts into this book. And his thoughts are the history of redemption, or the a history, the administration of God. And what does it mean to be omitted from this book? It means that these generations did not understand the history of redemption of God. So what must we do in order to understand the history of redemption? We must love the redemptive word and we must eat it daily. Therefore, we always eat it and we must understand it. What does it mean to eat and understand it? We eat because we have to live. Right? In order to live spiritually, in order to eat, live physically, you must eat and digest. What does it mean to eat? It means we must accept it in faith. And what does it mean to digest the word? It means that we must act upon it. When you look at Revelation chapter 10 verse 10. You can see the appearance of the little book. When you eat the little book, it's sweet. But when it enters into the stomach, it is bitter. What does it mean when you receive the word of God? It's so sweet. 
But when you try to act upon it and obey the word, it is it is not easy. But we must understand it. We must accept it, and we must digest it in order to give it to others. And when you look at Ezra chapter seven verse ten. Ezra said, "You must study the Word of God, and you must practice it. And furthermore, you must teach it. You must teach it through this life. We may be able to understand the redemptive history of God, and when we do so, we will not be omitted." But we will receive the blessing of being recorded in the book of life. Therefore, I pray that you may eat and digest the history of redemption every single day, and I bless you in the name of the Lord. Next, number two. Let's look at uh, the number of generations omitted during the slavery in Egypt. Now, if you look at the chart there, we see that Jacob took his seventy family members and entered into Egypt. That was eighteen seventy six B.C. when Jacob was one hundred and thirty years old. In Genesis chapter 46, it records the 70 members. And when you look at verse 12, you see Judah, Perez, and a sixth, mem sixth um, generation, Hazron, who is recorded in verse 12. What does it mean? It means that Jacob and Judah, Perez and Hezron all went into Egypt together. So we have to concentrate on the name Ram. We can see that Hezron's second son was Ram in First Chronicles chapter two, verse nine. So from Jacob to Ram, they all lived around the same time, and there were no omissions between Jacob, Judah, Perez, Hezron, and Ram. And Ram was a person who lived early in the period of the slavery in Egypt. Then all we have to know is when did the eighth generation live? And we can judge if there was an omitted period between Ram and Amindata. So the eighth generation was Aminadab. This Aminadab, there are several proofs on what period of time he lived. The first clue is that Aminadab's daughter married Aaron. We all know who Aaron is. Aaron, the older brother of Moses. Aaron is a person of the final period of the Egyptian slavery. So we can see that Aminadab's daughter married Aaron, means that Aminadab was a period of the latter stage of the Egyptian slavery. And Aminadab's son Nashon was one of the leaders that led the tribe of Judah. This is recorded in Numbers chapter 2 verse 3. So Aminadab's son was a character of the uh, during the period of the Exodus. So we can see that Aminadab lived around the period of time of the of the latter period of slavery. And there is one other proof. There is a third proof. We all know who Ephraim is, right? Ephraim and Manasseh. Ephraim was the son of um, Joseph. And Ephraim is recorded in Genesis chapter 46, verse 12. So Ephraim was a person 
who existed when they entered into Egypt. And Joshua was a person who existed during the period of the Exodus. Now, we see in the genealogy that Ram and Aminadab, there is, it's just one generation. But when you look at a sec, uh, 1 Chronicles chapter 7, verse 20 through 27, that there are 10 generations that are excluded. So, there are omitted generations between Ram and Aminadab. So we can see that there are multiple generations that are omitted in this genealogy, proven by the Bible. Then, what do you, the administration of redemptive history from the omitted generations? What is it? So number one, why was it Egypt? Why Egypt? God made a covenant with Abraham, and that was the covenant of the torch. He made a torch covenant with Abraham. In order for the torch covenant to be fulfilled, Genesis chapter 15 verse 13 had to be fulfilled. And God said to Abraham, Know for certain that your descendants will be strangers in the land that is not theirs where they will be enslaved and oppressed 400 years. There, do you think that Egypt was the only foreign country? No, there was a lot of foreign different nations. So why did God cho choose Egypt? Why did he choose Egypt? And in order to accomplish the torch covenant and that reason is in Abraham's faith Abraham's faith for to look at the chart we can see the torch covenant in Genesis chapter 12 verse 10 and we can see Abraham and Egypt's relationship before the giving of the Torch Covenant. If you look at Abraham's life, we can see that he becomes weakened before Egypt, especially during the time of the Torch Covenant. The Torch Covenant was made in 2082 BC when Abraham was 84 years old. And when you look at the period of time before the Touch Torch Covenant, it records his, it records Abraham went from Ur of Chaldeans to Haran. And from Haran, he leaves his father and his family, and he enters into a land where God leads him. And he makes a pillar and, and, and lifts up thanksgiving in, a, in this foreign land. And as soon as that ends, all of a sudden, Abraham goes down to Egypt. Now, God told him to go to the land of Canaan. So why did Abraham go down to Egypt? Because there was a famine that came upon the land of Canaan. If there was a famine, then Abraham should have held on to God and prayed to him, saying, Oh God, you know, please help me. But instead, Abraham, he thought that he was going to die in the famine. So he went down all the way to Egypt. He brought his entire family to Egypt. And so we can see Abraham's faith being weakened before this worldly nation. Now, if he made a torch covenant with 
with God, then he must have the assurance, right? That God is alive, that God is real. But in verse 15, even after making the torch covenant with God in verse 26, we can see Abraham being weakened and entering into Egypt. And he obtains Hagar in the land of Egypt. And he gives birth ultimately uh, to Ishmael. Now, God, when he says that he'll give descendants to Abraham, he said that he'll give it to him through Sarah. But Abraham could not wait because Abraham was old. So Abraham imagined to himself, how can he have a child with Sarah? So he had relations with Hagar, the Egyptian, and had Ishmael. We could see Abraham, who became weakened in front of Egypt because of his worldly thoughts and his desires of the things of this world and his impatience. And because of these things, he relied on Egypt. He should have relied on God, but he relied on Egypt because of the famine. And he became one with Egypt by having relations with Hagar. Not, be, not believing in God's covenant. Now, God knew that Abraham would be, be weakened. And he knew that Abraham's descendants will be weak before such a powers. So that is why God led the Israelites into Egypt. When you look at Genesis chapter 22, when Abraham sacrificed Isaac, he was recognized as being righteous. And his faith, Abraham's faith continued from Isaac to Jacob and to Joseph. And therefore, Abraham's descendants, they, there might be a chance that they may be weak, but God wanted them to be strong through the faith that was passed down. But unfortunately, the Israelites were unable to keep the the living faith. Now, if we were to look at this briefly, you can see Revelation chapter 11, verse 8. We can see a spiritual Egypt. In this spiritual Egypt, is described as a place where the Lord was crucified on the cross. When we look at the first coming of Jesus Christ, there were Pharisees, Sadducees, elders. They all said that they are with the true descendants of Abraham. But in order to keep their authority, in order to keep their power, they crucified Jesus Christ. With their lips, they said they were the descendants of Abraham. Then Jesus told them that, hey, if you're Abraham's descendants, then you must act the way that Abraham acted. Now we're all living in this spiritual Egypt. In order for us to defeat this spiritual Egypt, we must understand the will that was given to Abraham. 
not a faith of being enticed by Egypt, but the faith of defeating a different faith than the Egyptians, a different uh, faith uh, than the Israelites who crucified Jesus Christ. Although he came as the Lord of suffering, he will come as the Lord of glory. We must hold on to this, our Lord, and we must never let him go. In Revelation chapter 21, verse 22, the returning Christ, he will be our temple. And this temple is located in the new Jerusalem. Therefore, our congregation members must always look forward to the Lord of glory who will come. And we must carry our own cross and enter into the new Jerusalem. And I bless you in the name of the Lord. Secondly, Number one, why did they go to Egypt? Now, they did not understand God's will, and they forgot God, and they lived a life that was completely full of the Egyptian lifestyle. And so they became a generation that forgot God. So during the 430 years in the Egyptian slavery, they were completely assimilated to the Egyptian culture. And they forgot God. What does it mean to be assimilated? Now, in Korean and Chinese characteristics, it's Tonghua. It means that they became one with Egypt. They were the same as every other Egyptian. Therefore, they lost uh, God. They forgot God. So how did they forget God? What did they do wrong? There's two reasons. First, it's idolatry. Idolatry. And where did they worship these idols? In the land of Ham. Psalms 105, verse 23. Israel also came into Egypt. Thus Jacob sojourned in the land of Ham. When you look at Genesis chapter 15, verse 13, we can see it's the same. That they were assimilated into. Uh, that they came into the land of Egypt. Who is Ham? Ham was the second son of Noah, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Right? But when you look at Genesis chapter 9, verse 22 through 23, Ham was cursed. Now let's look at this briefly. Look at this incident briefly. There was Sam. Now, when you look at Genesis chapter 9, verses 26 to 27, Shem was blessed by God. What blessing did he receive? God says, hey, I will be your God. He became the God of Shem. And Japheth, what blessing did Japheth receive? Japheth received the blessing of of being residing in the tent of Shem, meaning that he can serve the same God. However, Ham, as I said before, he was cursed. What type of curse did he receive? He said, you will be Shem's slave. Why did they receive such different Results. We have to know this in order to utilize it in our life. In Genesis, 
chapter 9, verses 22 through 23. We see Noah was drunk and naked in his tent, and Ham entered into the tent, and he saw his father's nakedness. Then Ham should have covered his father with a cloth or something, but as soon as he saw his father's nakedness, he went out and he started speaking loudly to his other brothers. But Shem and Japheth, They took this cloth and they walked backwards into their father's tent and they did not lay their eyes on Noah and they covered Noah with the clothes. So they took the clothes and they walked backwards and they they covered them up and they came back out. Now, when I see this, uh, I I remember Adam. When Adam sinned and he fell, God covered him with leather clothes. What is this garment of skin? It refers to the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. And it also refers to the blood of the cross which ultimately represents the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. So God, who covered the nakedness with the leather garments, it shows the love of Jesus Christ that covers our sins with his own sacrifice. And Shem and Japheth, they understood this. They covered Noah, not just because they revered him as a parent, but because they understood the love of God. Therefore, they received this blessing that he can call uh, Shem his God. But vice versa, when we look at Ham, who was unable to do this, he was cursed. So, let's return back because of this ham could not uh, serve the God of Shem ham in order to understand ham we must look at his sons when you look at his sons you can understand ham's characteristic when you look at Genesis chapter 10 verse 6 we can uh, see the appearance of Ham's children. First is Cush, second is Mizraim, uh, third is Put, and fourth is Canaan. Cush is around the period uh, around Ethiopia, and Put is Ethiopia, and Canaan is where Palestine is. So why must we look at Ham's children because Ham's children have relations to Egypt. Egypt's ancestor was Mizraim. So let's look at uh, Ham's children a little bit deeply. When we look at his son, Cush's son, it was a person named Nimrod. We've heard of this name quite often, right? Nimrod is a person who made the Tower of Babel. The Tower of Babel, what does it mean? It means that they, pe- the people were not centered around God, but they lived a life centered around, around other men. And that's what Cush and Nimrod were like. The second son was Mizraim. He was the ancestor of the Egyptians. Egypt was a nation that went against God and put also has relations with Egypt that they will be judged alongside Egypt. Ezekiel chapter 30 verses 4 through 5. And lastly, let's look at Canaan. 
Deuteronomy chapter 7, verse 1. We can see that the seven tribes of Canaan must be uh, kicked out, and they and uh, Canaan was one of the seven tribes. He was the ancestor of the seven tribes. And when you look at the characteristic of the seven tribes, they were all centered around uh, humanism, and they served other idols. So we can see Ham's descendants were I idol worshippers, and they were humanistic. And that is what Egypt represents. In Joshua chapter 24, verse 14, the Israelites worshipped the idols and the gods of Egypt. So, when you when we look at right before um, the Exodus, we see that God sent down the ten plagues, and the reason for sending these ten plagues is recorded in Exodus chapter twelve, verse twelve, in order to judge the idols of Egypt so that the Israelites may never serve uh, the idols of Egypt and that they may only the Egypt the Israelites may only look at the almighty God who had power over these idols so in Colossians chapter 3 verse 5 therefore consider the members of your earthly body as dead to immorality impurity passion evil desires and greed which amounts to idolatry. I pray that you may understand this word. We are all living in this spiritual land of Ham. And during this time, we must hold on to the redemptive word and we must obey and defeat the land of Ham. Now, if we're to organize this briefly, in order for us to escape the land of Ham, just like it's recorded in John chapter 10, verse 30, God, the Father, and I are one. And we must believe in Jesus as such. When we look at Philippians chapter 2, verses 6 through 8, He existed in the form of God. In order for us to defeat idols, we must believe in our Holy Trinity. Deuteronomy chapter 6 verse 4 records this. We, when we hold on to God, we'll be able to escape Egypt. And when we hold on to our Father, He will allow us to crucify all of the characteristics of Egypt. Galatians chapter 5 verse 24. So I pray that all of our Green Hill Church saints may hear this word and may we all crucify our earthly characteristics with Egypt. Now first, the sin of not keeping the Sabbath. They did not keep the Sabbath. Now uh, on the lecture notes, it, there's a typo. So please change the title to uh, the sin of not keeping the Sabbath. When you look at Genesis chapter 2 verse 3, we can see that the seventh day was sanctified and he rested on this day. So God's plan was to rest after creating the world. But Adam, in Genesis chapter 2, verses 17, God made the covenant 
of Acts with Adam, right? Hey, don't eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. If the day you eat from it, you will surely die. So there are two paths, obedience and disobedience. To eat from the tree of life and to rest with God. Or what did Adam do? He disobeyed, ate from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And so she fell. And God's rest was shattered. There so, therefore, God gives us rest and allows us to recover this rest through Jesus Christ. Now, keeping the covenant is the goal and the method of reaching this goal is rest. And among the Ten Commandments, God gave us the Fourth Commandment, that we must remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. The word remember in Hebrew is jakor. It means to remember. And it is a command form of jakar that we must keep and remember. And we must inscribe it deeply inside our hearts. So we always say, hey, uh, you have to, you have to inscribe it in your heart. And in Chinese characteristic, what is this? It's Chua uh, U Miao, and we all have one. So Chua U Miao basically means to um, hold it close to you and and keep it forever. So, what do you hold close to you? I pray that all of the Green Hill Church members may hold on and remember the covenant and keep the Sabbath. When you keep the Sabbath, the path to God is opened up. And if we look at this word to remember, God is telling us to remember something that happened in the past, right? Something happened, so we have to remember it. So what what is this incident? Now, when the Ten Commandments was given, it was the period of Moses. Meaning that there was something to remember before Moses' time. And yet the Israelites, they did not remember it, and they did not keep it. And we can see this incident within the calendar of Egypt. The calendar of Egypt was not one week, but it was 10, or I'm sorry, uh, it was 10 days long. It was not seven days long. And one more thing. After the Exodus, God gave one more thing called the feast. The feast in Hebrew is Hag. Hag uh, derives from the word Hagag. And Hagag means to dance, to be joyful, to be happy, and to celebrate. 
we must always be joyful and and celebrate God. Now a celebration we or I'm sorry, on a feast we always remember on the special day what we're supposed to remember. Whenever these feasts come, we must regularly give thanks to God and we must regularly remember Him. God's people must keep the Sabbath. And when we look at Genesis chapter 12, verse 2, before the Exodus, God gave the Israelites a new calendar to keep the Sabbath. We do not live on the time and calendar of Egypt, but we must live according to God's new calendar, God's new time. In God's timeline of redemptive history, we must live in the time of Kairos, where God's time is referred. And when we do so, we'll be able to defeat Egypt. So although they were descendants of Abraham, they worshipped idols and they forgot God. Then what did God do? He erased he erased them and omitted them from the genealogy. And what does it mean to be omitted from God's uh, genealogical book? It means that we cannot participate in the true rest. In order for us to participate, we must enter through Jesus Christ, who is the Lord of Sabbath. Now, if we to draw a chart real quick. When you look at creation, the first day, second day, fourth day, fifth day, sixth day, and the seventh day, and the eighth day, man was created on the sixth day. But Adam fell because of disobedience. And so Jesus Christ came to this world and he hung on the cross. And the day that they hung on the cross was on the sixth day. How can we know this? This is recorded in Matthew chapter 28, verses 1. We can see that on the first day after the Sabbath, Jesus resurrected. So the seventh day is the Sabbath, right? So on the first day after the Sabbath, Jesus, he resurrected on the third day. He received victory on the third day. And what does the number eight represent? It represents a new creation, a new redemptive history. Therefore, we keep the Lord's Day, the Sabbath, with Sunday, with Sunday service. So when we keep the Sabbath, we will be able to go before this new creation, this new world. So I pray that all of you may find true rest within God and His day of rest. So when you look at Hebrews chapter 4 verses 9, all of those who have entered into His rest have rested from His work. In conclusion, in order for us to defeat Egypt, we must have the faith of a living being. 
of a living person. If the Israelites had the same faith, then they would not have. They would probably survived Egypt. They would have probably given thanks in Egypt. And in order for us to have the faith of the living, we must live a life that is centered around the church. A true church is a church like this, a church that proclaims the word of God, a church that uh, takes seriously the sacrament and that is disciplined and that lifts up a true worship and fights the good fight. And this is what the basic image of a church is. Through this, the saints This is the fundamentals of a church that holds Jesus as the head. And this also shows what the saint must do. The saint must love through fellowship, must be obedient and devoted to the church, and must evangelize. and passing down the faith to the next generation. And this church is an image of a true church. This is the only way to defeat Egypt. Now, we must live a life that is centered around a life in the church. We must spread the word. And when we do so, we'll be able to defeat Egypt. Now, today we looked at the omish, omitted generations, right? So, we must not uh, become those who are omitted in genealogy, but those who are recorded in the book of life. And this is the lesson given to us through the 430 years in the Egyptian slavery. So let's all end with Revelation chapter 3, verse 5. Let's all read it together. He who overcomes will thus be clothed in white. Oh, oh, testing, testing.
먼저 기도를 드리겠습니다. 아버지 감사드립니다. 
quote, conquer Canaan. And as we can see, when Canaan was conquered under Joshua, then in 1050 B.C., as we know, Saul becomes the first king of Israel. This, in fact, is the time period of the judges. So we see that this is a total of 340 years from the time of the judges. Now, there's something that's important about the date 1390. We can see under number one, and this will be your answer here, the Canaan conquest of 16 years ends under Joshua. Secondly, in 1390, Joshua dies. And thirdly, very important, is Joseph's bones are buried in Shechem. What this means is that was the fulfillment of the torch of the covenant at that time. Now, there's some question as to the validity of the time of the judges. In other words, some people say that the time of the judges was 410. Others say that it was 340 years. So, there are, why the discrepancy? If we take the regnal years and if we add those up all in one time, we're going to see that we come out with 410 years. But what this doesn't compensate for is that there is an overlap. There is an overlap in the time of some of the judges. I want to take a quick look at uh, this chart here. As we can see between the time of Ehud and Shamgar, and also during the time of Jola and Jair, we can see in Ehud and Shamgar that there's a question mark here, and, and it alludes to the fact that that was part of Ehud's time. The same with Tola and Jair. We can see that under Jair, it lists this as Tola's time. Also, during the oppression, the oppression of the Philistines for 40 years and then the oppression of the Ammonites for 18 years, if we look at the dates that this took place, and then we, we look at the dates for the Ammonites, we can see that those, in fact, coincide. So, based on this, we come to the conclusion that it was 340 years that the time of the judges was. Now, it's time to have a little fun. I'm going to put a map up here, and according to the third book of the History of Redemption series written by Reverend Abraham Park, he lists 12 judges in that book. This map that I'm going to show you has 13 names on it. What I want you to do is look at this and tell me which one of these people is not a judge. And then I want you to tell me what person it is that they helped. And thirdly, I want you to tell me what was this person's occupation. And I'm going to give you 30 seconds to do that. seconds to figure out who it is that's listed on here that is not a judge. Okay. If you said Barack, then you were correct. Barack is not a judge, even though in a lot of places that you may look, Barack is listed as a judge. Now, what judge is it that he helped? He helped Judge Deborah. What they did is they came together and they defeated a person named Jobin, who was king of Canaan at that particular time. Now, what was Barack's job? He was actually a general in the Israelite army. But even though he's not classified, quote, as a judge, 
he is listed in the book of Hebrews in chapter 11, chapter of faith, in 1132. And it says, and what more shall I say? I do not have time to talk about Gideon, Barak, Samson, Jephthah, David, Samuel, and the prophets. So if you said Barak, you were correct. Point number three. What brought about the time of the judges? In other words, what was transpiring that the time of the judges came about? Joshua was credited with conquering over 90% of Canaan. And what was supposed to happen is the tribes were supposed to go in and they were supposed to remove that is your first answer on that, the, the sheet under number three. They were to remove the Canaanites. And if you remember, in the book of Deuteronomy, chapter one, excuse me, chapter seven, verses one and two, God is very specific in telling them before they ever entered into the land of Canaan, when you go in there, are to totally destroy the Canaanites. In other words, they were to show them no mercy. So, when we look in the book of Judges, if you look in chapters 1 and chapter 2, you're going to see that this did not take place. So, the first thing they did is they didn't remove the Canaanites. The second reason was because there was no strong leader. If you remember after Moses, Joshua was the strong leader that took the Israelites into Canaan. But once Joshua was to pass away, there was no other leader that was strong enough to take over at that particular time. Another factor is in the book of Judges, chapter 2, verse 10. It tells us that the people not only didn't know God, but they had no idea what it is that he had done. But the most important thing that brought about the time of the judges sorry, the most important thing that brings about the time of the judges was their repeated cycle of sin. And we will speak about this more as we go through this thing here. In the book of Judges, chapter 1 and 2, we find an explanation for the spiritual decline of the Israelites. The downfall of Israel begins shortly after the death of Joshua. And as the book of Joshua ends, Joshua's generation is passing away. So Joshua is reaching out to the next generation, and he wants them to embrace the covenant that had been given to their forefathers as their own. He calls upon them to decide who it is that they're going to follow. In the book of Joshua, chapter 24, verses 14 and 15, Basically, Joshua is asking the second generation, who are you going to follow? What choices are you going to make? But there's something very interesting also. When we look into verse 19, we're going to see that Joshua says this. He calls upon them to decide whom they'll serve, and in spite of their express determination to serve God, Joshua warns them that they will not be able to fulfill their commitment. They simply could not live up to the standards of a holy God. So Joshua tells them that even though they have a desire to follow God, God is a holy God, and they will never be able to live up to what is expected of them. Now, point number four is the question is were there 
omissions during the time of the judges. So to find this, the very first thing we got to figure out is how many generations should there have been. So when we look in the book of Matthew 1, we're going to be looking at the first 14 generations. Now we know that Abraham's birth, you can follow along in your sheet there, it was in 2166 B.C., and David's ending reign in Hebron was in 1003 B.C. This comes to a total of 1,163 years. And as we know, the Bible tells us it's between 25 to 30 years between each generation. So if we take 1,163 years and if we divide that by 25, we're going to see that we come up with approximately 46.52 generations, which evens out to about 46 generations. Yet, there's only 14 generations that is listed in that first period. So we know there were omissions that occurred, and the question comes, where did it occur at? There's four figures in Matthew 1 genealogy that we need to be concerned with. We'd already said that the time period was between 1390 and 1050 B.C. And we already, uh, we know that Solomon and Rahab were at the beginning of the conquest of, of Canaan. We know that because Solomon was one of the spies that went into the city of Jericho, and he actually stayed with Rahab, and he eventually ends up marrying her. And secondly, we know that Boaz and Ruth were at the end period of the judges. So there's four people that's actually listed, and those four figures is Simon. Boaz, Obed, and Jesse. These are the four people that are listed during the time of the judges. So if we said the time of the judges, 1390 to 1050, if we say that that is 340 years, then why is there only four people that are listed during that 340-year period? If you look at the book of Ruth, chapter 4, verse 20 to 22, and 1 Chronicles, chapter 2, verses 11 and 12, Matthew, chapter 1, verses 4 to 6, and Luke, chapter 3, verses 31 to 32, every one of those is going to list this particular order. So that's why most theologians say that there's no omissions during the time of the judges. Because every one of them lists the Solomon, the Moaz, the Obed, and Jesse. But Reverend Abraham Park, in writing the third book, it clearly points out that there were omissions during the time of the judges. And I want to take a look at that by the following chart. very important verse is 1 Kings chapter 6, verse 1. Sometimes in studies you see all these dates that are up there and people wonder, where did these dates come from? How, how do we know which date is correct? So this basically says in 1 Kings 6, 1, that it was 480 years after the Exodus and it was in the fourth year of Solomon's reign that the temple was starting to be built. So if we took 966 and 480, we're going to come to 1446 B.C., which is actually the time period that we're confirming in this date right here. So what we're trying to find out is whereabouts the omission occurs during this time period. 
So in 966 B.C., the fourth year of Solomon's reign, then in 970 is when he became king. And we know that Solomon and David and Saul, each of them had 40-year reigns. So if we take the 970 plus the 40, we'll end up with 1010 B.C., which was King David's reign. His beginning, and he was 30 years old when he became king. So if we take the 30 plus the 1010, we'll come out to the time of David's birth in 1040 B.C. And using the 25 to 30 years as a generation, we'll just use the 25. We'll see that in 25, 1040, we end up 1065 B.C. for Jesse's birth. Another 25, we end up at 1090 B.C. with Obed. And then 25 will give us 1115 B.C. with Boaz. Now, Solomon is identified in here in 1406, the time that he went in, into the land of Canaan. So we're looking at approximately a 300-year gap between Boaz and Solomon. And with that gap, we can approximate that there's about 12 generations that would have been omitted during that time. One question. Out of these four people, they ask, who is the most important person out of those four? A lot of people say, well, it's got to be Boaz because he's the first one that congregates after Solomon. But really, that's not true. Obed is the important person because he solidifies or he locks in this 25, 25, and 25. So we know from this point, going here to Obed, to Jesse, to David, that there is no more omissions in the time of the judges. The omissions that occurred was right here during this time period. So we know that there were omissions, and the question comes up, why were those their omissions in that time period? Israelites' victory, you can follow along in your, your chart there, it was only partial. As a matter of fact, in the book of Judges chapter 1, the chapter begins by saying the incomplete conquest of the land. So we see that they did not totally remove the people from the land. And God had told them earlier on, if you don't remove the Canaanites from the land, they're going to be a thorn in your side. They are always going to be a difficulty for you. Secondly, is that they had coexistence with the enemy. Think about if you live next to your neighbor. You may not like your neighbor, but you can't get rid of it. So what do you do? You coexist. You have to live with that person next to you. And that's exactly what the Israelites did. When they couldn't remove the Canaanites, they just started to coexist with them. In other words, they just acknowledged that they were there. Thirdly, is they started to cooperate with the enemy. Instead of annihilating the Canaanites, the Israelites started to tolerate them. In the book of Judges, chapter 2, verses 1 to 3, God told the Israelites that they have disobeyed him and that the Canaanites would be a thorn in their side. Fourthly, the Israelites were corrupted by the enemy. God intended for his people, God wanted his people to be separate, and holy. This was the key word, separate. In other words, no interference. Nothing that's going to make them lose trying to be holy for God. 
But what happens is that the Israelites, in tolerating the enemy, they start to intermarry. And before they knew it, they became like one people. So instead of the Canaanites being here and God's people being over here, God couldn't distinguish between the two. They were like one group. They were like one people because they couldn't get rid of them. So they started to cooperate with them. They started to tolerate with them. And what happened? That led to them intermarrying with them before they know it. Everything the Canaanites were doing wrong, the Israelites were following right in behind them. But the most devastating thing of what brought the omissions of the time of the judges was what's referenced down here. We said earlier that it was the repeated cycle of sin. And this is expressed down here. The Israelites would sin. God, of course, would punish. Then they would repent. God would forgive or he would raise up a judge to save them. They would forget and then the continual cycle of repeated sin would continue to keep going. It never stopped. It was just a continual cycle. Have we ever been in a situation that we're there and we pray to God and say, God, if you get me out of this time right now, I will never get into that situation again. I will never make that mistake again. And then God does exactly that. We repent. He forgives. What happens? We forget. Good example. You look at our country today, you see what happened on 9-11. How many people even reflect or know about what even took place and why? And this is exactly reminiscent of the time of the judges. It would kind of make sense after all of this repeated cycle and repeated time that sooner or later the Israelites would wake up and say, you know what, I don't know what we're doing, why we keep getting back into this same roundabout this and that. But they never stopped. They just continued. And not only did they continue to sin, but when they repented and were and God would raise up a judge, the next time that they dropped into that cycle, they just continued on in even more wicked ways. So they didn't just go back to the beginning and stop. They continued, and the sin just compounded one on top of the other. And in addition, in the book of Judges, chapter 21, verse 25, this is, the, this is the one that says that everybody, in those days there was no king. So everybody did what they thought was right in the sight of their own eyes. And the people at that time, they thought, you know what? God's will is God's will. So I will live according to my will. This is the way that the people lived at that particular So, what is the historic, the redemptive historical lesson of today? I think the first thing we need to do, or I need to do, is to give thanks to Reverend Abraham Park for writing the third book about the Judges. I don't think that I could have ever read the book of the Judges and ascertained out of that what we were studying and what we looked at here today. So, I give thanks that he was able to put these things together and put them into a book in such a way that we're able to easily understand what transpired at that time. So we learn from the history of redemption and from Genesis 5, where we see that Adam lived contemporaneously with nine generations. And as we remember, Adam, of course, sinned. 
living for the 930 years outside of the Garden of Eden during the nine generations, he was going to those different families, telling him or them of the experience that he had. He probably shared his experience of his sin, the repentance that he went through, and the painful recovery that him and Eve had to do. Secondly, there were descendants who did not heed the lessons of Adam. Even though Adam went around expressing to the people what they needed to do and how they needed to live because sin was that terrible, nobody was heeding. Nobody was listening to the word. How can I say that? God brings punishment through the flood and saves his people in the ark. How many people got in the ark? Eight people. Remember in the book of Genesis, chapter 5. Genesis chapter 5 gives us the first ten patriarchs. If you look at the first nine, i.e. Adam, the next patriarch was Seth. When he started doing that, Every single patriarch, it says that they had other sons and daughters. If they had other sons and daughters, then what happened to them? Why is there only eight people that got on the ark if there were other sons and daughters? Were they not listening to what Adam was trying to give to them? And if we look at this, we can see that there's many similarities in our generation today. People hear God's word, and then they make a choice that they'll accept hearing God's word or that they will reject it. Those who make a choice in their life to accept or reject God's word are faced with the consequences that come from that. Now, Joshua, as we said earlier, he had high hopes that the second generation would somehow come around. But if we remember in Joshua 24, 19, Joshua told the people before he even died that you're not going to make it because you can't live up to the standard of a holy God. Even though they all had the, train, the same training from God at that time. So what did they do? They chose to live a rebellious life. They had a choice. They could have lived a life for God, but instead they chose to lead a rebellious life. And the fruit of their decision is that eventually they lost the Ark of the Covenant. Now, another point is those who lived during the time of the judges would not accept God as their king. They would not acknowledge God as king. God's one desire is that he wanted them to be his children and he wanted them to be their king. Instead, they lived a life that was separated from God. In other words, the desires of their heart, that's what they followed, not the commandments of God. And in doing that, what happened? It led to the destruction of a nation. It tells us in Proverbs 14.34, if God's words are not heard, the result is that sin and disobedience will flourish. So the question today is, are we allowing God to lead our lives today, or do we think that we know better? But even with all of this going on, remember in the very first part of when we were talking, we said no matter what the Israelites did, God was always there to forgive them and to nurture them up. And in this case, 
God continued to build the Israelites and he built them into a powerful nation through which the Messiah would come down to this earth. So what should we take away from this study? In other words, what is our lesson for today? First, is that we must break our cycle of sin. I have five points, but I wasn't able to get four of them on there based on uh, space. So the first answer is we need to break, break our cycle of sin. Because if we don't break our cycle of sin, we may be unfortunate like the, the Israelites were, and we may be taken out of Jesus' genealogy. And secondly is even when we sin, God is there to forgive us and give us another opportunity to walk with him. God loves us, and we should never miss the opportunity to repent. And the good thing about repenting is we don't have to come to church to repent. We don't have to be in any special place doing anything special. We can repent at any given point in time by telling God that we're sorry for what it is that we have done. Thirdly, is we need to seek God before we make decisions. Before we make decisions in our life, we need to seek God. Fourthly, and, and this, is, this is important, especially for the children. The people that God used as judges were ordinary people. These weren't people that were in some seminary or they were in a Bible school and God took them out and said, hey, I got a mission for you. These were average, ordinary, everyday people that God used. And in this case, this is the answer is called. God can call anyone at any time for any purpose. On our own, we are incompetent and we are insignificant. But when we are in the hands of God, we are able to perform great work through His power in order that we can glorify Him. And lastly, as we look at today's world, we may think that Maybe we're living in the, the time of the judges, or maybe we're living in the time of Noah right before the flood. Either way, I believe that God is giving his people a wake-up call. And what does he want us to do? He wants us to be discerning in the end times. And the only way that we can be discerning in the end times is to be filled with the Holy Spirit. God wants us to be aware of what is going on. Uh, I used to tell the, the kids when I was doing the Barnabas group that we don't live in a bubble. We live in the world. And just like any great military commander or anything else, you have to know your enemy. You have to understand your enemy. So you have to be discerning. You have to know in, in today's world, there is so much information, so much everything that is put out there. The average person has no idea between right and wrong. And the most important point is, is right now, within our lives, we need to be loved. We need to be good, or we need to be base in, in what? In the Word. If we hear things, if we don't have any biblical knowledge, if we don't have any biblical foundation, how do we distinguish between what's right and what's wrong? This is why it's important 
and especially we're blessed in this church to be here because we learn a tremendous amount about the Bible and the Word. And we need to take advantage of every opportunity we have to do that. Because as time goes on, the world doesn't somehow start to turn around and get better. It will just progressively get worse as we go on. And the only way that we will survive in this world is to have God with us, Emmanuel first, and the Holy Spirit to help us to be discerning in this world today. Now, I'd like to say a few words in conclusion. I will skip this part here. God's love for us gives us a path of repentance. This is the important word, God's love. If we look at this, this is not similar to the one we looked at earlier with the repeated cycle of sin. We sin, and God is going to punish. But through God's love, we, re- we repent, and we're what? We are forgiven. There's no greater thing about when we sin to get all the way to the part that we are forgiven. Because we know in God's word, when we're forgiven of sin, it is forgotten. It is not something that's going to be bought back. So this is the key right here. All of this, the sin, the punishment, God's love, the repentance and forgiveness, it's all based because that's how much that God loves us. That's how much that he cares about us. So again, in conclusion... How important is it to God that we pass on the word to others? In the book of uh, Genesis, chapter 18, verse 19, and also in Deuteronomy 6, 7, and eleven nineteen, they both say that in first, Abraham, God was directing Abraham to teach his children and his household on ways that they were to keep the laws of the Lord. And also in the book of Deuteronomy, God is telling Moses to teach my commandments to your children. When you are walking, when you're talking at home, when you walk along the road, when you lie down, when you get up, at every single point in time, we should be talking to our children. God's instruction was firm to teach the children the commandments of God. But what happened to the second generation in the time of the judges? It's one or two things. Either the parents were not passing on God's commandments to the children, or the children were not heeding and listening to what had to be said. This job of training our children in the ways of God, it it wasn't just for the Old Testament but it applies to us today. If we look at the book of Luke, chapter 18, verse 15, God is saying that those like children will be the ones that will enter into the kingdom of heaven. So how do we receive the kingdom of heaven like a child? It means to have the simple, trusting attitude that children show to adults on whom they depend. Our duty is to give our children an opportunity to receive eternal life. There is nothing more important as a parent to a child than to offer them no matter what clothes they wear, what type of car they go to, what college they go into, it's all immaterial. Why? Because it's not going to last. When we pass on and move on, and when those children pass on and move on, it's not important what college they went to or anything. What's important is how did they live their life in this? Was it for the world or was it for God? We must put our total trust in God to receive 
this right here, this eternal life, in other words, sharing the word of God with your children, this is the most important thing that we can do to them. There is nothing greater than that. The love of God, as far as us, it knows no bounds. Jesus makes us lie down in green pastures, and he leads us besides quiet waters, keeping us from hunger or thirst, and he hides us under the shadow of his wings as a resting place for us. He will also tenderly embrace us when we wander about without a place to go, wiping every tear from our eyes, and at last, he will lead us to his eternal tabernacle. I'd like to read one verse, and then we'll close. It comes from the book of Ezekiel, chapter 37, verse 27. It says, My dwelling place will be 